Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for braving the weather and coming out to hear uh, Joaquin talk today. Uh, we're very fortunate to hear from uh, Dr. Joaquin Vieira of the University of Illinois about aspects of uh, star formation at high redshift. Uh, Joaquin, I've known Joaquin a long time. Uh, he is an expert on inferring the physics of galaxies at high redshift, especially star formation. Um, it used to be true from millimeter, submillimeter uh, observations. That's where he got his start, but he's branched out. So he's got other wavelengths in his repertoire now, and he's going to tell us about that today. Um, in fact, just my uh, a personal observation, uh, since I've known Joaquin so long, I am going to embarrass him uh, and just mention that I think it's fairly remarkable how in such a short time he has progressed from a prediction, which was of the uh, just the brightness distribution and the number distribution of a certain class of objects at high redshift. He's progressed from that prediction in a very short span of years to finding candidates for those objects and then following up uh, to confirm them, uh, which I personally think is a very impressive feat. And I think he's going to be talking about that today. Um, now I'm going to give you the resume stuff. Uh, Joaquin did his thesis at the University of Chicago with John Carlstrom. I believe the title of his thesis was um, Extragalactic Millimeter Wave Sources in the South Pole Telescope Survey Data, which is rather a prosaic title, if I may, for um, the beginnings of a campaign uh, that Joaquin has been deeply involved in, if not led, uh, that has changed real, a lot of what we think about some millimeter galaxies at high redshift. Um, so, so he finished his PhD in 2009 and he went on to Caltech where he was a postdoctoral researcher with Jamie Bach, who was a recent visitor here. Um, and he joined the faculty of the University of Illinois in 2013, uh, where he founded and is now director of the Observational Cosmology Laboratory, which involves maybe a dozen or so undergraduates in scientific research. Um, and uh, he's known for other things. Among them, he's a member of the Origin Space Telescope Science and Technology Definition Team. Um, and uh, he remains uh, deeply embedded in the physics of star formation at high redshift, and that's what he's going to tell us about today uh, in his talk, High Redshift Star Formation Under the Cosmic Microscope. So let's welcome Joaquin here. Thank you for having me. Uh, wow, it really is a spotlight. Okay, so I'm going to parse this title for you real fast. So high redshift, by high redshift, I mean typically greater than redshift 1 and kind of specifically redshift 2 to 7, uh, but maybe extending beyond that. Um, star formation, you know, how stars form, the physics of that, um, how, and the observables uh, that we use to measure that. Um, and then under the cosmic microscope, uh, this is gravitational lensing. Okay, so this is an Einstein prediction from Einstein. Um, and here I'm just going to show you kind of two highlights. This is the telescope that we use to discover these galaxies. Um, this, I, as a grad student, I was involved in building this. I was really an instrumentalist. Um, and then part of my thesis was to go get some pesky sources out of our catalog. And it turns out that some of them were very interesting. And these are what they look like now. So these are snapshot images with Hubble and ALMA. So the blue is one hour or one orbit, which is roughly an hour uh, with um, uh, Hubble. Um, and it sees the uh, starlight from the kind of Redshift 1 universe, and particularly the foreground galaxy, that is gravitationally lensing a background, very high Redshift galaxy, which we see in red, observed with ALMA. Okay? Now, if you look in the Hubble image, these red galaxies are invisible in Hubble, even in an hour of staring. And these are two-minute snapshots with ALMA that turned on in 2012, roughly. Um, and just to emphasize that more, this was when ALMA first turned on. It was with 16 of the now 15 antennas, so it wasn't even complete. They were still commissioning it. Um, and so it, it really, to me, like kind of highlighted this new era that we're in of submillimeter astronomy, which is the era of ALMA that we're in now. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about what we've been learning from these objects and how we found them. 
Okay, so obligatory kind of big picture plot. Um, we call this the WMAP trumpet plot or something, but you know, here's where, where we are today. We're looking across cosmic time to the very beginning. Um, something happened in the early universe, which right now the theory is inflation. This is what John Kovac studies and tries to measure. Um, th then we have the uh, surface of last scattering, which is the, the radiation left over from the Big Bang. Then we go through the cosmic dark ages. Then the first stars, first galaxies turned on. At about redshift, kind of three to two, uh, one, somewhere in there, we go through cosmic high noon. This is when the universe was uh, going through its peak epoch of star formation. So most of the gas was being turned in the stars that epoch. Um, and then we kind of coast to the current uh, uh, state of today, where star formation is less than in the past, um, but we are in our currently evolved state. Okay, so here is, this is a plot, and this is f fundamental to cosmology, maybe not you know, parameter cosmology, but how we got where we are today. On the x-axis, I have redshift, or age of the universe. So this is today, this is long in the past, um, even prior to a billion years after the Big Bang. Um, and here we have the star formation rate densities. This is how many stars are being formed per cubit volume. And there's two main ways of measuring this. One is, you might think is direct, which is counting the UV photons from those young stars, okay, and that's shown in blue, um, with uh, the errors on that measurement. And they extend to very high redshift after about redshift eight. These are done typically with satellite images, uh, satellites like GALAX um, at low redshift, and then Hubble in the deep field at high redshift. Um, the problem with that is that um, half of the UV power produced since the Big Bang and if you think about it, most of the power in the universe that's on the sky came from the Big Bang. And then the second source of power was you know, gravitational collapse and UV light from stars. So half of all that light and all that power has been absorbed um, by dust and re-radiated here in the infrared. Okay? Um, and you see that the, our measurements here in the infrared have lagged behind that in the UV. Partly this is due to the lag in technology. These red photons in the far infrared at like 100 micron have much lower energy. They're harder to detect. Okay? Also, those wavelengths are mostly, um, uh, 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 that light is mostly absorbed by our Earth's atmosphere. To, so to measure this, you have to go up into space, which is expensive and difficult. So here again, we see our measurements. Um, this, these are kind of the latest and greatest measurements, um, which extend up to about redshift three, okay? And our error bars start to expand. And we don't, we don't have good measurements of this at higher redshift. So to get a whole picture of this, we have to correct the UV light for dust, okay? And then make a joint, model of what we think the star formation is doing. So here are mo three different models of what we think the star formation history is doing, and you see that they go all over the place. So what we really need is you know, better measurements of this, but also we need to understand what's happening at high redshift. How is the dust being produced? Where is it being produced? When is the first dust formed? Um, what is the makeup of galaxies? Like how much dust is in them? And how much of the UV light is absorbed by dust and re-radiated? Re -radiated? So this, you know, wrapped up in there, I would say, is big picture. We have cosmology, the history of star formation, and we also have the physics and details of uh, galaxy formation. Okay, so this is kind of my, as a physicist, let's think about what makes a galaxy. Um, so if, if we had just one number that we were going to use to characterize a galaxy, I would say that that's stellar mass. Okay, galaxies are made of stars, and if we count up all the galaxies or the aggregate light from, of, 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 from the stars, we can quantify how many stars are in that galaxy. And basically we do that by doing um, uh, optical and near-infrared photometry near the stellar bump here at about um, roughly around one micron or two microns. Um, the next thing that we want to know is the derivative on that. How many new stars are being formed? That's the star formation rate. Okay? And of course, we're not seeing stars being born and counting them. We're seeing the aggregate radiation from that, those stars being formed. Typically, you know, we would like to measure just the UV flux, but that's, uh, as I said, absorbed by dust. The next typical measurements are measuring um, hydrogen transitions like H alpha, passion alpha. Uh, a, a, a powerful m method is to measure the total infrared radiation, um, which can be difficult as well. You have to usually go to space for that. Um, new methods that are uh, starting to come to use is to uh, measure uh, ionized carbon, 158 micron, or even water. Okay, so I'm going to sh stop for a moment and explain this chart. So this is wavelength on the x-axis and power on the y-axis. And this is the intrinsic light that would come from a galaxy from all the stars if there were no dust. Okay, but there is dust and gas. So what happens, that light gets reprocessed, and this is the observed spectral energy distribution of a galaxy that we would see in the presence of dust. So you can see that all this power gets absorbed and re-radiates here. And that's just the magic of dust, okay? Dust is absorbing those UV photons, heating up, re-radiating. Okay, 
Um, so we measured the total stellar mass, which is the integral of all the stars that have um, been, been formed. We have the star formation rate, which is the derivative. And then we have the gas mass. This is the star formation potential. This is the fuel for new stars. Um, really what that is is H2. H2 is notoriously difficult to measure. So what we do is uh, try to measure a proxy for that, which is usually done with CO, which is the second most abundant molecule in the universe. Um, but we can also use uh, neutral carbon. We can also try to measure the dust mass and infer the um, interstellar mass and the, and the gas mass and even uh, measuring the extinction, um, how much light is absorbed by, by, uh, by the dust. Other things which, you know, depending on what field of astronomy you're in, you might call details or you might call really important. There's the central black hole, so what is its role? Um, and then of course, all these galaxies are sitting in dark matter halos, okay? That the, the, the defines kind of the environment and, and the inner role of, an, an, of a very active core in all these galaxies. So there are other details, but this is, you know, my take on one of the important things in a, for galaxy evolution. Okay, let's look at the spectral energy distribution of galaxies in um, a little bit more detail. So here I've taken three standard, again, kind of in a simplified form. There's roughly three types of galaxies. I mean, there's all different kinds of the spectrum, but on one extreme, we have very actively star-forming galaxies. So a general truism in the universe is that whenever stars are being born, they're enshrouded in dust. Whenever they die, they produce more dust, and they're enshrouded again. So star formation always happens behind a veil of dust. So here for a galaxy that's, this is M82 in this case, um, for a galaxy that's actively forming stars, you, here you see the stellar bump, and I've normalized all these galaxies by their stellar mass. Um, and here you see all the infrared radiation coming up from that, coming out from the, in that heated dust. In a typical kind of L star or uh, Milky Way type galaxy, like a spiral, um, in this case it's M101, uh, you see there's roughly 50-50 in, in terms of power coming for, directly from the starlight, um, and then that, that's that's then re-radiated by the, absorbed and re-radiated by the dust. Then the end point of galaxy evolution is just a boring elliptical. All the gas and dust has been turned into stars. So there's no current or very little current star formation rate. The star formation potential is also gone. There's no more gas. And we have just an amorphous elliptical galaxy. Okay, and that's shown here. Um, okay, so, so let's talk about cosmic dust. You know, when, when I started, you know, when I kind of got into this, I was a, um, I, I was, John Kovacs' academic younger brother, and I was doing CMB instrumentation. And when I first heard about dusty galaxies and dust, I just thought, who cares? You know, like, why do we care about space dust? Um, and I started, when, when I was working on my thesis, I started reading papers, and I found that it was actually really awesome. Um, and not just because my career sort of depends on it now, but here's my uh, kind of bullet points of why I get really excited by dust. So dust was first noticed about a, a century ago by astronomers attempting to understand the structure of the Milky Way. Okay, of course, Harlow Shapley was famous for this, for looking at uh, the globular clusters to you know, kind of work around the dust and understanding our place within the Milky Way. Um, in 1983, the IRAS satellite, satellite launched, and this enabled the first systematic study of dust across the whole sky. Also enabled, um, you know, one of the greatest discoveries were debris disks, like Beta Pic. Um, and also uh, the fact that there were invisible galaxies near us, that the optical light was effectively completely obscured, obscured by up to, you know, 99.9% .9 of the light was obscured, and it was radiating in the infrared. Um, the next up was the COBE satellite. Um, this showed that half of the energy produced since the Big Bang was absorbed by dust and re-radiated in the infrared. So this tells us that cosmologically, dust is very important. Um, the majority of mass produced by stars at the end of their life, um, sorry, of dust mass, um, is usually from AGB stars. Um, and there, you can also get dust produced by supernova. And an interesting fact is that, you know, for AGB stars, these are evolved stars. It takes billions of years for them to evolve. And so the dust production mechanisms over cosmic time should change. In other words, above redshift 6, you can really only produce dust by kind of lower mass stars um, or maybe some really high mass stars um, and supernova explosions. Um, whereas in the more local universe, we have kind of, we've had time for these uh, stars to evolve and, and kind of shed their dust um, from their atmospheres. Uh, star formation, again, always occurs behind a dense shroud of dust. So if you really want to see how stars are being formed, you have to peer through the dust. And dust is a crucial uh, constituent of everything from the evolution of planets to galaxies to supermassive black holes. So every aspect of astronomy is affected by dust, and it's an important role. It's not just a nuisance. Um, dust also represents the rise of complex chemistry in the early universe. And this may even be a catalyst for the ingredients necessary for life. So dust is cool. Um, here, just for kind of pictures, here's that plot I showed you of you know, unattenuated uh, starlight in a galaxy versus what, is, what comes out when it's reprocessed. 
Here's an image of a dust grain. I think this one was captured from space. And so there's small little grains. They're typically um, carbon and silicon chains. Um, okay, so here is a SED. This happens to be my favorite galaxy. This is ARP220. And again, here's the spectral energy distribution. We have wavelength on the x-axis, flux on the y-axis. And I fixed its luminosity here. Okay, so here's the dust. So we see um, all this light has been absorbed by dust. It comes out here. And for this plot, I've fixed this galaxy's luminosity like, like you would a light bulb. Like it's like a 60 watt light bulb, and I just move it away. Okay? So think about a light bulb. You start moving it away, it gets dimmer. Or it's one over r squared, right? But, and if I know the distance, I can infer the luminosity. But there's something weird going on in space, which is the universe is expanding. So all those wavelengths of light also get redshifted. Okay? So again, way, the, this galaxy, I've fixed its luminosity, and I've just started moving it away. And so we see this SED at redshift. 0.01, 0.1, 0.5, 1, 3, and 6, okay? Now look what happens. This is called the K correction, where as this galaxy gets farther away, it's getting dimmer as one of our squared, but it's also getting redder, and we're going down the, uh, the Veen side of this stellar black body. So distant galaxies are harder to see in the optical, not only because they're distant, but because we're going down this Veen side of the black body, okay? Looking at galaxies at high redshift with like Hubble, this is really hard. Okay? Even with JWST, this is going to be really hard because we're just going down this peak. Look what happens when we go on the Rally gene side of the black body, though. Okay? The steep slope on the Rally gene side almost perfectly cancels out the dimming due to luminosity distance. Okay? So I'm going to change this plot a little bit. Rather than showing the flux versus redshift, I'm going to ask, let's pick one wavelength and not ask what the flux versus redshift for a given wavelength is. Okay? That's, that's the next slide. But same exact you know, same data in the plot, and I'll point out this magic effect. So in the optical, like here we have, well, or near infrared, so here's light from like Spitzer 3.6 micron. You see that the flux, i.e. the measured brightness of one of these galaxies, as you start moving it away in redshift, plummets. It falls off faster than one over r squared, okay? Same within the radio, when we're over on this part of the spectrum. In the far infrared and then submillimeter, this magic effect happens, where we start climbing the SED on the Rally gene side of the black body, okay? And you see that the flux is flat with redshift. Okay? What this means is that if we measure flux, we measure luminosity. Fine. That's cool. What it really is cool, though, is it means we can detect these things independent of redshift. For a given luminosity, we're equally sensitive to them across all redshifts. Now, if you think about astronomy, the business of like, you know, cataloging how, uh, you know, uh, how things evolve in time and space, it's always harder the farther away you get. Well, here's a sample of galaxies in a wavelength of light where we can measure them and find them no matter where they are in the universe. Doesn't matter about the distance. So that's really cool. And that's basically magic. So people knew about this for you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, the first kind of uh, time that this was really, people started using this for good, <laughs> or you know, not just curiosities on qualifying exams, um, was, was really with um, the advent of submillimeter telescopes, mainly in Hawaii. So this was one of the first. This was the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. And one of the first early cameras put on it was the SCUBA telescope. Okay? And this was the first map they did. This was the Hubble Deep Field. This was at 850 microns. And this was, um, th this was published in Nature in 1998. So they did 2.2 arc minutes over the Hubble Deep Field. And that right there, I'm going to talk about that source. But that was the first submillimeter galaxy discovered. So that was the first galaxy discovered independent of redshift with this technique. Over time, um, in, uh, instruments improved. The maps got bigger and better. Um, data analysis techniques improved. Uh, the technology improved. The instruments improved. And over the course of about a decade, we went from kind of two square arc minutes to about 200 square arc minutes, finding, you know, going from finding five sources to finding dozens of sources. Circa 2009, the Herschel Space Telescope launched, which was one of the, well, depending on how you count, it was the largest space telescope launch. It was a 3.5 meter. Remember, Hubble is about 2.5. Um, and it had a three color bilometer array um, that operated at 250, 350, and 500 micron. Now, at these redshifts that, that these galaxies live at, this is roughly straddling the peak in the dust spectrum, in the dust SED. So color is roughly redshift, okay? but it's degenerate uh, with temperature. So it's like you're measuring TD over 1 plus C. But here, the blue galaxies are typically at low redshift. The red galaxies are typically at high redshift. This is confusion limited, meaning that wherever you look, there's a galaxy. There's gal this is not noise. These are all galaxies. And the resolution, even though it's a big telescope, the resolution is really poor because it's diffraction limited, and these are long wavelengths. 
Um, so all the sources just blend together, okay? But, uh, and just for reference, here's that original scuba map for scale, okay? And there's that first submillimeter galaxy discovered. Herschel kept mapping, that was the Hubble Deep Field again. Um, it mapped 100 square degrees and then even close to 1,000 square degrees over its lifetime. Um, it discovered hundreds of thousands of these, these galaxies. So, so the problem was no longer finding the galaxy, the problem is now figuring out what the redshift is. Because again, it could be at any redshift. And we have some clue from the color, but it's not very good. So dusty, discovering these dusty galaxies is trivial. The bottleneck is obtaining a redshift. Because you can't understand the physics of these without spectroscopy, and you can't do spectroscopy unless you already know the redshift and can figure out what the lines are. So how do you get the redshifts? Now these are hard. Typically people get redshifts from like Lyman alpha or H alpha. Um, these are optical lines. These are very dusty galaxies. Those optical photons are absorbed. Um, furthermore, the beam of these instruments were large. Um, these were typically, you know, something like uh, 15 arc second beams. And within that error circle, there would be sometimes five, sometimes even up to 10 optical galaxies that you would see in Hubble. So which one of those galaxies corresponded to the galaxy that made all the submillimeter emission, or which one was vigorously star forming? So people used the well-known radio, uh, uh, radio far infrared correlation. So they um, performed the blank submillimeter uh, survey. Then they followed that survey up with the VLA. Um, and then in a deep radio map, they would find the most probable counterpart based off of the radio mission. Then they would take the largest telescope at the time, optical telescope, CAC telescope, spend nights observing these and look for, usually it was a single line, which they would assume was Lyman alpha, and then make a redshift distribution. And then, yay, this was a paper in Nature in 2005 by Chapman et al. Um, they tried to correct for their known biases, the big one being that you're discovering these things independent of redshift, then you're following up in the radio where you don't have that beneficial K correction. So you discover these independent of redshift, but then you're following up in the radio where it gets fainter and fainter with distance. So the highest redshift ones you're missing. They knew this. Um, and then furthermore, you're following it up with optical spectroscopy where again, the farther, the, the higher redshift ones were just not there. The more dust obscured ones were not there. So this was difficult business requiring all the best ground-based telescopes um, and the space-based telescopes that were available at the time. A better way of doing this really started here with the advent of the SMA. So people did their blank field um, bolometer surveys, the blank field survey. Then they followed up with a submillimeter interferometer. And this started, I don't know, Dave, when, how, when did SMA turn on? 2005-ish? Yeah. And this, is, I, this was kind of one of the first big extragalactic projects, right? Uh, and this was a lot of time, as I understand. This was a, yeah. So a night and object with SMA. So, Here's the, um, this, is the, uh, this is the discovery contours. Here's the SMA uh, uh, detection in gray. And then here they, in circles, that's the SMA position. So now they're looking in the radio, um, in the mid-infrared, in the near-infrared, and then in the optical with all the great observatories, this is Spitzer, Hubble. Um, and now they have an accurate counterpart. So you don't have to rely on the radio anymore. And once you have a reliable counterpart, you can then go drop your night of Keck on it um, and hope for Lyman Alpha. And lo and behold, they found the highest redshift submillimeter galaxy to date. This was at redshift 5.3, okay? So look, we're going from petering out at redshift just shy of four, okay? This is all, this is the measured histogram of redshifts. Suddenly, when they can get rid of the radio, um, they can go up to redshift five, kind of straight off the bat. This was a sample of five sources, and they found a redshift, um, or maybe of seven sources in the paper, I think. Um, but they found one, one at redshift five. Okay. So what's an even better way of doing that? Well, you can bypass the optical altogether and the counterpart identification. So remember I talked about that first submillimeter galaxy discovered. It had, people had, astronomers had not succeeded in obtaining a redshift for this uh, in more than a decade, and it wasn't without trying. Uh, we had tallied it up and, you know, like more than a dozen nights of Keck had been spent trying to get this, hundreds of hours of, with GBT, and finally they uh, had a proposal to spend 100 hours with the Plateau de Bure um, and they detected uh, a CO, okay? And here's that initial detection, and then they followed it up in other bands uh, to confirm the redshift, and they got a position directly from the dust with the same observation. So here's that galaxy zoomed in in the Hubble deep field. Again, this is, you know, uh, what was this? Something like 30 orbits with Hubble. Uh, there is that detection. It's invisible in the optical, and the redshift turns out to be 5.2-ish, okay? This was another Nature paper. Um, Okay, so that, that's the better way to do this. So you, you discover the source in the dust, independent of redshift, then you follow it up, and you look for a redshift in the submillimeter from CO, which is effectively tracing the dust, but you're bypassing the optical altogether, because it turns out it's useless. 
Sorry. <laughs> but, I didn't mean to offend anybody, but in this case, it actually was. Um, uh, and, and you don't even need the radio. So this is the better way to do things, just all from the submillimeter, um, especially for these dusty sources. So sp let me introduce spectroscopic redshifts with, with carbon monoxide for a second. So CO is the most abundant molecule after H2. Remember, H2 is really the fuel for new stars. It has rotational transition, so every 115 gigahertz, there's a line. So if you measure two lines, you have an unambiguous redshift. Um, the luminosity is quite high, so here's uh, a synthetic spectrum, but you see the lines, they're, you know, they're very luminous. The total um, uh, luminosity in these lines can be up to uh, 10 to the minus 5 of the total luminosity. CO is tracing the molecular gas, so again, it's, it's giving you physics, it's telling you the star formation potential. Um, you can measure the line width, and then you get a dynamical mass. Um, and if you measure multiple lines, you're measuring the, the con you're basically constraining the conditions of the interstellar medium. So this is a very powerful tool. Um, I, was, I participated in some of the first um, observations to get these blind detections, and really what we were waiting for was a sample of lens systems, because lens systems are typically magnified by about a factor of 10, okay? Magnification, if the flux is boosted by a factor of 10, that means it saves you a factor of 100 in telescope time, okay? So that makes, it goes from, you know, instead of spending 1,000 hours on the telescope, you can do this in 10. Instead of spending... Uh, 200 nights on the telescope, you can spend two nights and get a redshift with this. So this was one, I, I took this data, this was the uh, Z-spec on CSO, um, here's the CO ladder, and this one, this source was at redshift 2.9. Okay. Um, um, I'm going to change gears, okay, so I've told you how we can discover dusty galaxies that are otherwise invisible when we look in the optical or near-infrared. Um, and we can discover these galaxies with the submillimeter. We can follow them up. We can get redshifts and how we can start to understand the physics. Um, now this is kind of where I enter the field, and this is where um, I was when I was a grad student. Um, so we built the South Pole Telescope, which was, is the largest telescope devoted to observations of the cosmic microwave background. It's at the geographic South Pole. It's 10 meters. It's an off-axis Gregorian design. Um, the resolution uh, is about arc minute, the same as human resolution. So it has a relatively big beam by astronomy uh, standards, but small for CMB. Um, it's really optimized from the ground up for fine scale anisotropy measurements. We call it a telescope, but really it's an experiment in the sense that all it does is scan back and forth with one camera and one team. Okay? So it's not like you can go propose or go observe on it. Um, and we put one camera on at a time, and roughly every five years we upgrade it. So everything I'm going to show you now is with uh, the sources we discovered from the first generation camera and survey. At the time, this was a very ambitious camera. It had a thousand pixels. Now, if you've ever counted the pixels on your phone, that may not sound Im impressive, but it was roughly an order of magnitude increase over what had been fielded before. Um, now it's quaint. Now we just fielded a 15,000 detector camera, and John Kovacs fielded, whoa, many more than that. Um, so uh, this was the first generation camera. It observed um, at three, uh, three different frequencies, uh, utilized superconducting cryogenic uh, detectors. Um, I'm not going to really get into that. That's a whole other talk. What I want to just sh sh say with this is that we had a first generation camera, which ran from 2007 to 2011, had three colors. Um, we then put on a second generation camera that effectively added polarization. Um, and we just deployed a third generation camera um, that will do better. OK, so this is the telescope. Um, this is at the geographic South Pole. For human for scale, that was my grad student, Andrew Nadalski, um, just so you can get a sense of scale for the 10 meters. Um, this is the current camera we, we deployed. Um, just for a sense of scale, so this whole thing gets cooled to uh, you know, 0.3 degrees above absolute zero. All is about 10,000 superconducting detectors. This is roughly life, life, life size. Okay? That's what these detectors look like. This is the first generation survey that's now complete. This was 2,500 square degrees in the southern cap, so we nicely avoided the galaxy and even the small and large Magellanic clouds. Um, from this, sorry, my pointer is going slow. Oh, there it goes. Okay, and the science, the primary science that we, uh, we built the telescope for was to study the cosmic microwave background. There's a bunch of papers there. Um, that's a whole other talk. Um, to discover galaxy clusters, to constrain dark energy, that's a whole other talk and galaxy evolution, which I'm going to kind of break off one small piece to talk about here. This is real data. This is what the image looks like. So again, we, we image 2,500 square degrees. This is something like a little bit less than 30 square degrees. There's the full moon for scale. All of this is real signal. These large-scale fluctuations, that's the cosmic microwave background. You see these bright sources. That's, you see the scale of the beam. These, about 90% of those are blazars. These are supermassive black holes accreting, spitting out a jet, and the jet happens to be pointed at us. Um, you see these dark spots in the map. These are, um, these are 
can think of as casting a shadow on the cosmic microwave background. We can detect those independent of redshift as well because it's a shadow, not a mission. Um, we count those to constrain dark energy. Not going to talk about that. Um, here's a massive cluster of galaxies. These are the largest gravitational, uh, gra gravitationally collapsed objects in the universe. These are blazars. And about 5% of these sources are strongly lensed high redshift galaxies. Okay, so how do we figure that out? Um, this is a, a plot of the source counts on the sky in the millimeter. Okay, so this is at 220 gigahertz or 1.4 millimeters. Um, on the x-axis is flux. On the y-axis is in greater than s per square degree. So in other words, if I tell you a, a flux limit that you surveyed, I can tell you how many sources on the sky you're going to see. And this is broken up by galaxy type. So the vast majority of sources are these radio sources or blazars, okay? um, active AGN. Um, the next most common uh, galaxies I sometimes call IRAS galaxies, but they're basically low redshift luminous infrared galaxies. But they're very low redshift. In fact, they're all less than 0 0.03 in redshift. Um, and then this is a, a population that had previously been undetected. And these are um, high redshift submillimeter galaxies that have been strongly lensed. Now the parent or the uh, the, the parent population are those sources of cosmic infrared background sources that are at high redshift, but they get basically randomly magnified by intervening galaxies along the line of sight. And so their flux goes from typically about one millijansky up to about typically 20 millijansky or so. Okay? And that's how we see them. So we have three colors with SPT, so we can disentangle all of these. It's really easy to veto or get rid of those blazars because we just look at the colors with SPT. We just look at the 1.4 to 2 millimeter color. We can also use an external radio catalog. They're really bright. Um, so we can easily separate out those different uh, those radio galaxies and throw them out and never look at them again. We can also easily uh, veto the low redshift dusty galaxies uh, because we can use a catalog like IRAS or even optical uh, uh, sky images like the digitized sky survey. I mean, they're really obvious. I'll show you an example here. Um, this is, uh, this, these are the SPT detection contours in red. Um, this is uh, an image from the uh, Blanco telescope. Um, this is a low redshift galaxy at 0 0.03. Um, in SPT, we saw this. This was 14 millijansky. This galaxy in SPT is 17 millijansky. Okay, it's at redshift 3.4. What is the counterpart? This is the problem I faced when I was a grad student. Um, first of all, we were in the deep south observing the sky, and there was nothing. You know, we had to go take all of our data ourselves. Turns out that the counterpart is actually right there, and it's invisible. Okay? Um, but this was the problem. But you also nicely see that K correction happening, where this source uh, is making as much submillimeter emission as oops, this source. Okay? Um, OK. So how do you find these lens sources? It was so easy, even I could do it, even when I was a grad student. Um, so there's this population of unlensed submillimeter galaxies, which make up the cosmic infrared background. And then there's the lens sources. All we have to do after we throw out all the other sources is make a flux cut, and that's it. So to find lens sources, you just select on flux. It's the easiest, simplest thing you could possibly do. So we made a catalog of these. Um, there were roughly, you know, of, of the 2,500s, I didn't do anything. Did you do that? OK. Uh, OK. So of the, this is, the, again, the 2,500 square degree SPT survey. And we selected 81 strongly lens uh, submillimeter galaxies um, above 25 millijansky at 870 micron. Um, there are more in there. At some point, we just had to cut it off. So what is happening with these galaxies? Um, here's the observer at Earth. There's a massive object that's, just, uh, that, that's you know, you can think of as distorting space time. Um, and there's a real object behind it. Light travels along um, the space time, and it gets curved, just like a lens. And so when we see it, it looks like it's over there. Okay? This also happens on the other side. So what you actually observe is something like a ring. Wow. Should I? Um, so this is an actual image from Hubble. Um, this is not my image. This is one of the famous lens sources. But here's the foreground elliptical galaxy that's the lens. This is probably redshift 0.3 or so. Um, here is a high redshift Lyman break or blue galaxy, um, redshift probably 1 or so. Um, OK, so how do you find these galaxies? So people have been finding these before. Um, this started in the 90s with the radio, in the radio. So they selected flat spectrum radio sources, which were high redshift, and they followed them up with high resolution with VLA, just did snapshots. 
and they looked for sources that broke up into lensing configurations. Um, they've built a sample of roughly 100 sources with this, and it was a, it was a lot of work. Um, also in the late 90s, they started targeting clusters. So this was smart. Rather than looking randomly on the sky to hope that you get one of these chance alignments, they knew where massive lenses were, i.e. clusters of galaxies, and they targeted those and looked for galaxies behind the cluster that were strongly lensed. Um, for that, you effectively had to wait for, that was the launch of Hubble, right? Um, also in the um, early knots, you had uh, digitized sky surveys like Sloan, uh, where you could use spectroscopic uh, spectroscopy, to, and you could sift through all the spectroscopy and look for lines of sight where you had kind of blue galaxies behind elliptical galaxies. They found a sample of, again, about 100 sources this way, um, and then they followed up with Hubble to get the lensing configuration and, uh, uh, um, and, and lens models. Um, and then the 2010s, uh, first with SBT and then with Herschel Spire, large areas of the submillimeter sky were surveyed at multiple colors, um, and we started selecting these just based off of flux. So this method has now found just as many sources as every one of those methods, and it did it really easily in a, in a few years. So what's happening? So the SPT sources, these are rare and bright. These are about one per 30 square degree, okay? Um, the SPT selection is independent of lensing configuration, okay? Because we're just measuring total flux, and that doesn't matter what the redshift of the source is because of that K correction, and it also doesn't matter really what the redshift of the lens is because we're not selecting on that either, okay? It also really doesn't matter what the, uh, what the lensing configuration is, i.e. what the mass of the lens is. We can select on effectively any, uh, any uh, uh, Einstein radius. Um, that's just the, the radius of which the Einstein ring is formed. Okay? And, and that's just dependent upon the mass of the halo. So uh, if you measure an Einstein radius, you, you know the, the mass of the, of the halo. Um, so the majority of these, uh, of these sources, you know, Prior to this, a priori, if you would have asked me, I probably would have guessed that, you know, what are the majority of lenses? Are they massive clusters of galaxies that have a huge cross-section but are relatively rare? Or is it regular galaxies which have a small cross-section but are abundant? And it turns out that the majority of these are galaxy-galaxy lenses, and they typically have an Einstein radius of about half arc second. That means that you have to have sub-arc second resolution to resolve these. And the magnification is typically about magnification of eight. Um, of the whole sample, we found about, um, you know, of roughly 100 or 80 sources. Four are cluster lenses, the rest are galaxy lenses, and four are unlensed, meaning they're just intrinsically very luminous. Um, now, how does this benefit? When the system is unresolved, you save mu squared time on the telescope, okay? So in other words, if you have a big beam, you're saving roughly a factor of 100 in telescope time. So that makes doing physics with, with, with difficult lines, it brings it from impossible to possible. Um, so this means it's great for line surveys. Um, when we resolve the system, okay, uh, lensing conserves surface brightness, so when we resolve the sources, we gain an angular resolution by roughly the square root of mu. So we can resolve kiloparsec scales, whereas before these would be unresolved blobs. So this is an ex excellent complement to deep submillimeter surveys and also kind of pointed studies of unlensed sources. Okay, next up on my story is ALMA. So, we had found these sources, we selected them, we made a catalog, and we had nothing to follow them up with. Remember, South Pole Telescope is at the South Pole. Uh, we couldn't use SMA, we couldn't use Plateau de Bure, we couldn't use Keck, we couldn't use VLA, okay? We could use Hubble, but they're invisible there. Um, so we were primed for ALMA turning on. Um, ALMA turned on in roughly 2012. It's the largest ground-based astronomy project of all time. It's the first truly international astronomy project. It was roughly, you know, 1.5 billion. It's located at 5,000 meters on the Atacama Plateau, and it consists of 50 12-meter antennas operating between 30 and 1,000 uh, 1, gigahertz. The resolution is greater than Hubble, and it was a revolution in sensitivity for the submillimeter. Um, so this really changed things. So um, in the first call for proposals, we put in two proposals, and we got both of them. The first one was to do a blind redshift search. It was really an experiment, okay? Remember, we had found all these things that we assumed were strongly lensed systems that we knew we'd selected independent of redshift. that could be at literally any redshift. Um, and we tuned, we did five tunings across all the three millimeter band with ALMA. Um, and we were just looking for the CO lines to traipse through the band, okay? And so this is a plot of frequency versus redshift for all the CO bands. Um, and where there's color line, we expect to see some redshifts, or sorry, some lines. And we only had two redshift deserts, which was a less than redshift one, which we weren't concerned about, and a little sliver between redshift I think 1.6 and 1.9 or something. 
Um, so we did this experiment, and you know, we had been st I had been struggling for years to follow these up. In fact, I had been struggling with uh, Matt Ashby to observe these with Spitzer, um, and with and, and I was kind of like priming myself for disappointment. And and I thought maybe it'd be great if we found at the time I thought it'd be great if you know we got redshifts for like a quarter of these horses, and it'd be awesome if we found one at redshift greater than five. Um, so we did this experiment. Um, we obtained redshifts for effectively everything. Um, this is the redshift distribution. It goes from redshift 2 to now 6.9. The median redshift is 4. And remember, this is unbiased. There's no luminosity selection here. Well, there's one luminosity selection, and that's it. It's flat with luminosity. So this is the history of extremely dusty galaxies turning on um, and becoming rare and shutting off, basically with the fuel supply disappearing. These are what typical spectra look like. Um, these are the lines. Again, they were very unambiguous. Um, detections in CO. This is a plot. This was in our Nature paper, um, 2013, showing all the spectra um, that are redshifted. So these are all the three millimeter tunings with Alma. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit pixelated, but here you see the CO lines. Um, the next plot I'm going to show is we take all of these and stack them together to show the aggregate spectrum. If this thing will obey my command, there we go. Okay, this is yeah, this is the stacked spectrum with all the lines. So. Here are the bright CO lines. Here's um, uh, neutral carbon. We see some water lines up here. We see HCO plus. Okay, so that's the spectrum. So stats. So this was about 81 sources in our sample. We've now gotten a redshift for all of these. Some of them are still ambiguous, but we've confirmed 69 of them so far. So in terms of spectroscopic completeness, you know, we targeted 81. We got 69 redshifts so far. That's 85 completeness. In terms of uh, high redshift galaxies, that's unprecedented. Um, the, like I said, the median is uh, redshift 4. We have 36 above redshift 4, 12 above redshift 5, and 1 above redshift 6. So this is by far um, the highest redshift sample of dusty galaxies and highly star-forming galaxies in the literature. Um, uh, uh, basically the same thing. I just want to show you this plot. This is a plot of highest redshift object by year. Okay? You've seen this in like textbooks. Um, this is the plot of, you know, uh, here's galaxies going through, and um, the big jumps here were the Hubble deep fields each time they came out with one of those. Um, here are quasars. Um, the quasars were kind of the leader up until um, certainly the launch of Hubble and roughly about the year 2000. The gamma ray bursts came on the scene. They were the leader for a while. Here's the highest redshift dusty submillimeter galaxy, okay? And you see that it's lagging behind. That's really just photon energy, okay? This technology is hard. In the optical and even near-infrared, there's uh, you know, military applications, commercial applications. They're developing all this technology. The technology in the millimeter and submillimeter, it's just us. It's academics. It's astronomers building this technology. That's the lag. Okay? The photon energy is hard. There's not a lot of development money pouring in. The point is, though, we're keeping pace. Okay? Um, and you know, we're going to keep finding high redshift sources. And we're going to keep probing to you know, older and older epochs in the universe. Whew. OK. I'm going to go, OK, so we also, in addition to the redshift survey, um, we also did snapshot imaging. So I showed this at the beginning, but the gray scale, that's Hubble with roughly one hour. Um, and the, the red image, that's just uh, one to two minute snapshots with Alma when it was still being uh, deployed. Um, this is SCP-81. This is a source that happened to be found with Herschel. But then they did this with science verification data um, once Alma, Alma was effectively fully operational. Um, so this is uh, something like 0 0.01 arc second resolution. This is a real image. This is all real structure. Um, this is a lens source. This is what the future is going to look like with Alma. Okay? Um, so just to show you what the power of that is, um, this is the effective resolution of Hubble. This is the effective resolution with Alma. And then with the aid of gravitational lensing, this is the effective resolution that you're getting with, with Alma plus gravitational lensing. So it's really acting to you know, increase the power and resolution of our telescopes. I'm going to skip all that. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to go here. This is the highest redshift submillimeter galaxy discovered to date. This is at 6.9. Um, this is the discovery spectrum from ALMA, shown there. Um, this is the uh, composite image showing ALMA in red and Hubble in green and blue. This is a foreground galaxy that's slightly lensing this just by a factor of two. Um, but really, the most of the flux is coming from these two objects, which appear to be merging. Um, this, in terms of dust mass versus redshift, this has more mass than the most dusty and extreme quasars, um, and is the most massive galaxy known um, at high redshift. This is, I'm going to sh show 
stop. Okay, I'm going to show you a movie of our data cube. Remember that alma is effectively an IFU, inter any interferometer is. And so this is stepping through our spectral cube of these two sources, and you see them too. Um, so these are strongly lensed. So this is the image plane, okay? This is our model. This is our, these are our residuals. Um, and this is the source plane reconstruction that we do after our lens modeling, okay? Um, and that was all in uh, C plus, or ionized carbon. So what we can do with that line, we can effectively reconstruct these galaxies in 3D. Okay, so this is a source plane reconstruction in C plus velocity. So we see this is a very mature like disk. This could be a galaxy at range of 0.3. Um, and this, I mean, no, sorry, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying it, it, as far as we can tell, it looks identical to that. You know, it's a disk-like structure. It's orderly. Um, this appears to be more like a dwarf galaxy with low metallicity. We've obtained O3 and C plus, which is roughly a crude metallicity indicator. We see that they have different metallicities. We can reconstruct these. Um, this we got roughly a week ago, not the fuzz, the... Okay, um, this is again redshift, uh, this is the, the same galaxy. This is with the higher resolution imaging from ALMA. This is in the continuum. Um, this is the most detailed look at the redshift 7 universe ever, period, okay? The advantage of these with Al and with ALMA is that we can ex uh, uh, study these galaxies in excruciating detail, okay? Not only in the continuum, but also in, uh, in uh, spectroscopy. We can image these in lines. Um, so this is really what ALMA was made to do. And that's just that's less than a billion years after the Big Bang. Um, this was an image that uh, Chris Hayward, a former grad student here, uh, made for the press release, just showing, you know, artist's impression of what this might look like. But this is from a real simulation. Um, so you have kind of a like LMC type uh, dwarf galaxy merging with a more orderly disk with a lot of dust uh, galaxy there. Um, one other galaxy that we found, this is also extreme. This one is unlensed, um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, a collection of, um, it, it's basically a massive cluster in the process of forming. So there's, we've detected more than 15 counterparts. Um, these are their spectra in C plus shown here. We've detected them all in CO and C plus. Um, here they are in a deep optical image from Gemini. Um, and this is a really dense concentration of galaxies going under a burst of star formation, um, producing a lot of submillimeter emission. In terms of inferred cluster mass versus redshift, this is the most extreme galaxy you could hope to find, okay? or collection of galaxies. So this is a massive cluster in the process of forming. Uh, this is about to come out in nature, too. Um, and here it is. So the, the total SPT survey is about the size of this whole wall. Um, this is a cutout of the 100 square degrees. Here's the SBT map that we found, and then there's the ALMA image of those, of those galaxies forming. Um, like I said, uh, there's the ALMA did this uh, image of SDP81 at redshift 3. Uh, we took that, that data was made public immediately, and this is just a cool thing that we can use these for. These are really physical test beds that we can do a lot with. So everything up to this point, I've been telling you things, cool things you can do with the foreground lens magnifying the background source, yeah? Okay, we can turn that around, and we can use that background source as a, as a light to highlight the foreground lens, particularly the dark matter in it, okay? So we make the lens model, we're imaging the dark matter, right? Usually it's with low signal, uh, signal to noise that you just measure the total mass in the, in the, in the halo. With ALMA, um, we can do this in such detail that we can measure subhalos. So we can measure the dark matter halos that would probably host a, a dwarf galaxy. Um, and one day, we, so right now we're discovering dark matter halos. That was with one source. We have an approved and nearly completed program to do three more sources just like that. Um, you know, one day as we build up the sample from 10 sources to 100 sources, this can be a powerful constraint on the mass of the dark matter particle. Because the mass of the dark matter particle um, affects the matter power spectrum of the subhalos, and we're measuring the power distribution of the subhalos, okay, the matter power spectrum. So that's just a cute thing. Um, and here's just a cartoon from simulation from Yashar Hezeva, who's the postdoc that leads this analysis, showing how you have the, the main halo here and you're putting a blob of subhalo around and how it's affecting the image. Okay, so we, we do that. So that, that's just a cool thing. So we've received data like that for three SBT sources. Here's one. This is at redshift four. Um, and these are just like straight out of the ALMA pipeline. We have, we've just started analyzing them. This is one we got yesterday, literally. Um, this is uh, 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 redshift 3.4. Okay. Just to show you that initial redshift survey, so this is number of ALMA projects we have by cycle. I, I don't mean to show off or boast, but that first initial little survey when it was just starting, once we had the redshift, it enabled all this other cool stuff that we could do. And we're now averaging something like, I don't know, six proposals a cycle that, that get finished and, and completed. So a lot of stuff is enabled. 
Um, James Webb Space Telescope is about to launch, hopefully. Um, and we were granted one of the, our early release science proposals. So um, uh, what that means is that you know, JWST launches, there's guaranteed time, there's general observer time that comes after that. Before anything, the director set aside time basically to shake out the telescope and do observations that everybody would need to learn how to use it and to shake out the instruments. Um, we put in a proposal and we were, uh, two of these sources are gonna be the first thing JWST looks at. So the first 10% of the time for JWST is going to these sources. Um, what we're gonna do with that, so this is a simulation. Um, this is uh, what these galaxies will look like in HST. This is what they would look like in JWST, showing the effective resolution. This is what they're gonna look like in JWST with gravitational lensing, okay? Um, what we're gonna be doing is imaging these things in H alpha, passion alpha, and the PAH lines. So we're gonna be, again, just like we're with, Al with Alma, we're looking at these with things with ionized carbon and reconstructing these in 3D. We're gonna be doing that with H alpha and passion alpha. Um, the point is to demonstrate extinction robust star formation rate indicators and really kind of link all the star formation rate indicators from the UV and the far infrared using the mid infrared and near infrared with JWST. Um, I'm going to skip that, but we're going to also measure stellar masses. I'm going to talk about the future a little bit. So everything I said was the galaxy we found in the first generation survey that started when I was an old grad student. Um, we've since finished our second generation survey, which is shown here. This is the SPT pole survey. This is 500 square degrees. It's about a factor of three times deeper. There's the full moon for scale up there. Um, and here's that plot again with source counts. So everything that I showed you was from that first generation survey. We've now deployed the third generation survey, okay? Um, and that's gonna be roughly an order of magnitude deeper in flux. In terms of high redshift galaxies that we're gonna discover, um, this, is a, this is a model, uh, but this is, you know, it's not a prediction really, it's a post-diction. Um, and the solid lines are the prediction in the model that when we go in and apply the same uh, simulated observations that we would do with SBT, this is predicting what we would see in terms of number of sources above a given redshift. In other words, with SBT, we found one source above redshift six. Okay, the model predicts, you know, somewhere around there. Um, this is the second generation survey prediction, so we're gonna see something like 10 sources above redshift seven. With the third generation instrument that we just deployed, we're gonna see something like 100 sources above redshift eight. Okay, this is roughly the number of sources that JWST is gonna find. Um, and these things are gonna be so luminous um, that we can study them in excruciating detail with ALMA, so it's gonna be really great. Um, now I just wanna show you the kind of people that have been involved. You know, obviously I didn't do all this work myself. Um, this is the team from 2007, right when we deployed the telescope and the camera and the readout electronics and the software and really this was the team that did everything. Um, there's the PI, John Carlstrom. There's me as a grad student. Um, this is the team now. This is circa 2016, we've grown. Um, this is the team that deployed the third gener generation camera. And if that comes back, this is the collaboration that follows up all the dusty lens sources. Um, so that's the size of collaboration. Just point out a few people. Uh, this is Dan Maroney, who is a graduate student here, and is, uh, he's kind of my partner in crime for most of this stuff and leading the group. Um, Tony Stark, who's here, although not here today, but he, he's at the CFA. Deshika was a postdoc here. Uh, who else can I point out? Chris Hayward was a grad student here. Uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, and then this is my group at Illinois that, that works with me. Um, so, conclusions. I'm out of time. Um, CMB experiments have made huge impacts in the field of cosmology. You know all this from John Carlstrom's work um, and astrophysics, and will continue to do so into the next decade. SBT has constructed one of the most unique samples of high redshift galaxies and strongly lensed systems. Um, and this gravitational lensing allows us to extend the capabilities of the current facilities, really the state of the art facilities, we're allowing them to push even further um, into what they can do. Um, we're resolving some of the most important open questions in galaxy evolution, particularly the part that's all hidden behind a shroud of dust. SBT, the SPT plus ALMA survey is complete, and it's opened up a new window on the molecular and fine structure lines at high redshift. Um, the far infrared observations, these are really crucial for um, observing the obscured and high redshift universe. Um, and we have many years ahead with ALMA and JWC is about to launch, so it's gonna get even more exciting. And then we have a new camera uh, deployed with 3G, which, uh, SPT3G, which I'm really excited about for the next kind of decade to work on. So thank you, that's it. Thank you, Joaquin. We have time for a few questions. For what? This magnificent technological achievements and just fantastic 
I was wondering if there are any scientific insights you've gotten so far that you're proud of that you could summarize. Yeah, um, so I, I kind of breeze over this. So at the lunch talk, I talked about we're using these, we're, we're kind of developing water as a high resistance star formation indicator. That I think is cool. And the first thing that we got straight out of this is just the distribution of dusty galaxies, of, of intensely star forming galaxies. Um, I think the biggest surprise to all of us was that there is dust at Richard's set. Um, not only is there a little bit amount of dust, but there's a massive galaxy with a huge reservoir of dust. So where does that dust come from? What's producing it? I think that's something that I'm excited about exploring over the next few years. Um, this is allowing us to study the fine structure lines, like ionized carbon, ionized oxygen. Um, and that's going to be a powerful probe for probing the metallicity and the evolution of these galaxies. And more importantly, it's probing them in a relatively optically thin way. So we're seeing the cores of the galaxy, not the suburbs. So I think that's going to be very powerful going forward. And this high redshift sample brings those lines to ALMA, right? Because they're high redshift. At low redshift, we cannot see those lines. But as they're redshifted, they come into the ALMA bands. And we need these high redshift samples to study with ALMA. And you know, redshift 7, we're into the epoch of reionization. So we're really seeing the first massive galaxies form. And we're able to take these amazing images. I mean, that, that image of the redshift 7 galaxy, that is the most detailed look at the redshift 7 universe you've ever seen, right? Um, so I, I could go on some more, but maybe we could talk after. I could just Another say question. one more thing on the dust. Mm -hmm. Unless you know the distribution of sizes, how can you make any estimates on the amount of massive dust? Oh, yeah. So, um, so we're measuring the integrated light, right? And so it's yeah. your, you know, Hildebrand 1983 is the, the main way, but we're, we're measuring the total emission from dust. As it's going to get trickier, I think, as we start going on to very small resolve scales. I mean, we're going sub kiloparsec. Ask me then. Because I'm, I'm not sure how we do it then on, a, on resolve scales. I think it's going to get a little bit tricky. Uh, in the integrated sense, I think we have the average dust mass in the galaxy. As we go down to, to higher resolution, I think it's going to get tricky. But then we'll have a job for life. There was a question in the back, and then we'll come to you. Uh, so you make the point with the k correction, etc., that you are doing, that you have to some extent doing unbiased surveys uh, detection. But now, uh, you talked a bit about lens, so then you have an additional geometric factor. Yep. Is it unbiased, etc., or is there an additional selection function of the direction? I made. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. So, I lied. There's two biases. Well, there's, so um, the first is that we're actually at l such long wavelengths that we're actually a little bit more sensitive to higher redshift sources than we are at redshift like two or three, okay? But we can go into the models and correct for that for the prediction from the redshift to compare, sorry, from the redshift distribution from the models to our observation. The second one is that there is a bias in the re measured redshift distribution due to the lensing, okay? And that's in two different ways. One is the fact that it's really an optical depth question, which is shown here. This is the probability of being lens versus redshift. Okay? So to be strongly lens, you have to have an object be in the, in, along the line of sight between the source and the observer. So at higher redshift, there's a higher probability of being lens. Right? And by the time you get to redshift 8, like every galaxy is effectively lens by something. So there is that bias. We know what that is, because we know what the large scale distribution of matter in the universe is. So we can correct for that and pull that out. The other one is that if there's a size bias to sources, like say, for instance, galaxies become more compact at high redshift, then they have a higher probability of being um, more highly magnified, and then more probable, uh, it's more probable to wind up in our sample. Right? We've looked for bias and size, not only in our data, which is biased, but in other data from blank field surveys that's not biased, and we see no evolution above redshift 1. So there are those two caveats, and we think they're fine. I mean, at least you just characterize them, right? But those are, that's a really good point. And, and when this measurement first came out, people all said, like, oh, surely there's a place. Yeah. Martin, yes. uh, about the origin of high redshift dust, I always like to point out that people uh, forget the possibility that winds from quasars can make uh, dust very efficiently, because they mimic the conditions in AGB stars. And we wrote about this. Long time ago, I'll tell you about That's it. That's interesting. So, so it, it makes the dust or it just ejects it? 
No, it makes it. They, hmm. It forms out of hot gas that then adiabatically yeah. expands and cools, and it happens to go through the dust formation yeah. region of uh, uh, AGB stars. So I, I breezed over the slide because I was worried that I was going to get yelled at. Um, but this is one of our sources of 5.7, and this is kind of like the great observatory observations of this source. So this is um, Richard 5.7, this was one of our highest rated sources. No matter how hard we look for an AGN, we don't see evidence of it. So this is, these are different than quasars, where it's really, the emission is all dominated by star formation. But, but it, people always ask, like, oh, is there a quasar, and is it dominated by this quasar emission? Quasars so, come and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. <laughs> and and I, I fully believe like, uh, that there is a supermassive black hole in all of these, um, but they're not quasar. <laughs> Uh, uh, quickly, you want to say a few words about uh, what the potential contribution of the Origin Space Telescope would be in this? Uh, I um, mean, it seems like uh, the, the the field is rather well covered between JWST and ALMA. Where does OST fit in? It could have been a plant. I swear I didn't. Could have. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is redshift versus observing wavelength. Um, versus very important lines that we would like to study these galaxies in. Things like Lyman Alpha, H Alpha, Passion Alpha, the PAH lines, um, silicon, oxygen, ionized carbon. Uh, look at how they change in redshift. So there's a kind of a gap in what we can observe at low redshift versus high redshift. Okay? And if you look at facilities, we have Alma here doing very good in the submillimeter and millimeter. We're about to have uh, JWST between 2 and 20 microns. Um, what we're crucially missing is this gap in here. And we need that if we're going to really trace these, you know, use these same observables to trace galaxy evolution across cosmic time. Right now, we can observe the high redshift galaxies and these really important lines like C. We cannot do that at, mid, uh, at you know, redshift 1, cosmic high noon. Um, we can observe you know, uh, the PAH lines at you know, low redshift, um, and we were able to do that at moderately high redshift. Uh, um, with, with JW, but we're missing that you know, at, at high redshift, and we would need that for, with far infrared surveyor. So to me, that is one of the strongest cases, is just to fill in the spectroscopic capability so we can really trace these same observables all the way across time. There's a few other things, but I think that's the big picture one. Right now, there's no capability here. It makes me mad. <laughs> so I think we have time for one last question. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. You shown the slide with the velocity fields and mm -hmm. line uh, ratios. Uh, I have two questions about this slide. First of all, how can you distinguish between the disk key dynamics and outflows? And second, uh, I'm a little bit confused how you can estimate the metallicity from oxygen to carbon. There's a paper by Nagal I can point you to. Huh? So it's, it's real rough and there's huge error bars on it. The fact is, chemically, they're very different. Okay, so that's the observable, is that they're different chemically. Um, what we interpret that as being difference in metallicity. As far as the, how do you tell, that to me it's not outflows, because we actually have, we have a paper about to be published in Science that shows, um, we have the first resolve outflows at high redshift, so it's a very different observation. For us, the real difficult thing is, how do you tell two merging systems versus an order disk? And basically, it's the rotation curve and the PV diagram. So buried in the appendix here is the PV diagram that shows that, and it looks uh, disc-like. I, I can show you after. All right, uh, well, any additional questions? I would encourage people to contact Joaquin after the talk. Let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>